When our founding fathers established this republic, they created a political and economic system, unions, a system which has led the United States to the very pinnacle in wealth and in world leadership. This series of programs is being presented to us understand better our, our American way of life. For today's topic, now a group of young people at the National Education Program Workshop in Searcy, Arkansas. At the classroom lectern is Dr. Clifton L. Gaines, Jr., historian. The American Adventure. That's rather an unusual designation for a course in economics and political science, isn't it? Well, the American way of life, which we will examine here, is rather unusual. In fact, there's nothing quite like it in all the world. All of us want to know more about our creed. What makes it tick? Why it's the best place on earth? Why it's worth understanding? Why it's worth saving? Why wars have been fought to protect it? During the 13 weeks of this course in the American Adventure, our general purpose will be to answer many questions about the American way of life and to explore the workings of the American economic and political system so that we may understand its significance and importance. Why should we bother to do this? Because in one generation, many of the nations of the world have become either socialistic or communistic. And the advocates of both of these economic and political systems have determined to gain control of our country. Let's look at this map of the world. Here live two and one quarter billion people. They work and worship under all kinds of economic and political systems. From dictatorship to democracy, from collectivism to individualism. Now let's see how socialism and communism have expanded since the end of the First World War. These dark areas are the nations that today live under communism or that have adopted a considerable degree of socialism. Some of them were overrun and captured by Russian communism, but some have drifted into or actually voted into being many fundamental aspects of socialism. The people were promised all sorts of material and economic benefits, so they decided to try socialism. In some of our later classes, we are going to examine socialism with its promises and results. And we're also going to shine the spotlight of knowledge on communism and some of its tactics in America. But in the beginning, let's just learn about the American system. Did you know that the founders of America, when they came here from England seeking freedom and a better way of life, established first a communal or collectivist economic system? They did, both at Jamestown and at Plymouth Rock. Let's look in a moment on the Plymouth Colony. In December of 1620, 101 pilgrims from England reached the Atlantic coast in the Mayflower. Their primary purpose in risking the great hazards of an Atlantic crossing and life in a primitive, unknown land was to gain religious freedom for themselves. They had no preconceived ideas about building a nation, a society, or a system of economics. By common consent, the colony's economic system was communal. The property was community property, or public property, owned in effect by the colony's government. The people worked together at assigned tasks. They shared and shared alike in the total production of the colony. It worked like this. There was a common storehouse. Each family brought all its produce of whatever kind to the storehouse. The government of the colony allocated the goods on a basis of equal shares for all. This was the Christian spirit of sharing. Our forefathers were people basically motivated by Christian principles. Many of them felt that they could best progress under this communal economic arrangement and have full freedom also. They thought they had an ideal economic system. Even among these dedicated Christians, however, with their great measure of freedom, the theory of government ownership of property and communal living did not work in practice. A few of the less industrious colonists discovered that no matter how little they produced and carried to the common storehouse, they still received a share equal with their neighbors. They began to loaf 
and to shirk their duty. The industrious, seeing they were being made to support the slothful, began to slow down also. Well, as one family after another eased up on their work and the production of vegetables, grains, and meat, the goods in the storehouse dwindled. In time, starvation threatened to wipe out the colonists. The leaders of the colony despaired of their communal experiment. Instead of providing plenty for all, the collectivist system had produced only an equal distribution of poverty and stagnation instead of progress. Something had to be done to restore the energies of the colonists. Either a way must be found to stimulate work and production through voluntary willingness of everyone, or the colonists would have to resort to the type of coercive measures based on force, which had been a part of human history for thousands of years. The Plymouth colonists did not want to force labor with police power. That was one way of doing it, but they believed that freedom was a godly heritage for all mankind. And they had fled from the old to the new world seeking this freedom. So when the communal or collectivist system carried them toward starvation, the governmental and religious leaders together proposed the establishment of the basic law of private property and the fundamental principle of self-reliance. Every able-bodied man was to become responsible for his family. The community-owned or government-owned farmlands and pastures would be parceled out for private ownership. People would exchange goods and services among themselves according to their abilities and desires. The industrious and the lazy alike would have to work or would suffer a self-inflicted penalty, one of hunger and disgrace. From this time forth, the people possess their own property. Thus at Plymouth was established this fundamental characteristic of American philosophy, just the opposite of the public ownership system of socialism and communism. Did it change things for the better at Plymouth Colony? It certainly did. The change in ownership and responsibility from government to the individual citizen marked the beginning of progress in the colony. It helped to establish the foundation of the American economic system. William Bradford, governor of the Plymouth Colony, wrote in his diary that when the system of private ownership was established and self-reliance became the rule, the housewife came out of her kitchen and the children gave up some of their playtime to work in the fields so the family could produce more and have more and live better. The fruit of their labor was there. No wonder they were willing to work. Who can deny the power of that incentive which is based upon the right to own property and to keep the proceeds of one's labor? That which happened at Plymouth had also happened at Jamestown 12 years earlier. Students of history will recall the colorful interludes at Jamestown with such leading romantic characters as Captain John Smith and Princess Pocahontas, the Indian maid who saved his life from the anger of an Indian chief. But so many people pass over the historic fact that a communal economic system was established at Jamestown with a common storehouse and equal shares for all. It failed miserably, just as it did at Plymouth. At Jamestown, the people almost starved under the communal system. And as at Plymouth, the establishment of private property and individual responsibility instead of government property and dependence upon the common storehouse, started the colony on the road to success. Here's what Captain John Smith himself wrote in his diary after starvation had been averted at Jamestown by the change to private ownership and individual self-reliance. When our people were fed out of the common storehouse and labored jointly together, he wrote, glad was he who could slip from his labor or slumber over his task. He cared not how. Presuming that howsoever the harvest prospered, the general store must maintain him. Even the most honest among them, wrote Captain Smith, would hardly take so much true pains in a week under the public ownership and common storehouse system as now for themselves they will do in a day, so that we reap not so much corn from the labors of 30 as now three or four will provide for themselves. Both at Jamestown and Plymouth Colony, it was historically demonstrated that men will not work to the fullest of their capabilities, 
without the incentive given through private ownership, the incentive of personal profit. And it was likewise demonstrated, beyond question, that so long as there is dependence upon a public storehouse, personal incentive withers and production falls, even among the most honest and Christian people, as Captain Smith and Governor Bradford noted. The positive lesson learned from these two examples is that the individual's right to own property, the spirit of self-reliance, and the presence of incentive, individual freedom, and responsibility work for the good of all. Today, these principles are found in our economic system, working for the benefit of all Americans. In subsequent classes, as we consider other phases of our economic and political life, we will consider the dangers that threaten the continued existence of the principle of private ownership. Posing such questions as, is the principle of private ownership being diluted with our permission, but without our realization of the danger? And is the pendulum in America swinging back toward public ownership after 350 years of progress unmatched in all the 6,000 years of human history? These are questions worth our consideration, aren't they? And we shall consider them. But for now, class dismissed. The American Adventure Series is a production of the National Education Program, Searcy, Arkansas, Dr. George S. Benson, Director. Dr. Clifton L. Gaines,